Good afternoon. I hope you're alert and awake for this exciting uh, session. Uh, it's my really distinct pleasure and honor to introduce a fellow IIT Bombay alumnus, uh, Shankar Shastri. So Shankar, first of all, is a distinguished alumnus of IIT, but in his case, his remarkable journey starts from being the gold medalist at IIT Bombay, and then he went on to hold faculty positions at MIT, Harvard, and returned home to UC Berkeley, where after being a chair, he has risen to be a Roy Carlson Professor of Engineering. He is a director of Blum Center for uh, Developing Economics, and most importantly, currently the Dean of Engineering at UC Berkeley, one of the most prominent engineering schools. Well, Shankar is remarkable, prolific. He is a co-author and editor of 500 papers and nine books and many awards. I won't rob him of time, but his really seminal recognition is to be elected as National Academy of Engineering, which is a quite an honor. So please join me in welcoming Shankar Shastri to this presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you know, it's a great pleasure and actually a, a feeling of pride to be surrounded by so many IIT alumni. So uh, it's, it's great to be at uh, the event here. Uh, you know, what I thought I'd do is to tell you a little bit about why I think it's so exciting to be in engineering and technology. And, more, and then towards the end, I want to say a little bit about how what we do can be really important for social problems. So uh, l let me start off with, uh, okay, the slides say. Okay, so I think that we are at a time when uh, technology is reaching outwards. And you know, we've, we've traditionally always reached out to the physical sciences, but now because technology is so integrally related in every aspect of our lives, it's reaching out increasingly into the social sciences. Certainly the biological sciences and physical sciences are already well underway. In terms of the social sciences, you know, we think about, uh, so many things we think about are on the, have, have implications in terms of economics, in terms of privacy, in terms of security, you know, and all of these illities that we, as a rule, hadn't been paying attention to. And I feel that there are a lot of big opportunities to really be, uh, to, to work on the edges in these so-called multidisciplinary projects. So let me give you a sense of these. You know, a lot, number of the logos here are these institutes or centers that we have created at Berkeley to be able to engage in these problems. Citrus, in particular, is the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interests of Society. So we deliberately, deliberately set this up as a center to think about the interests of society and what we could do for the interests of society. Trust was about uh, cybersecurity. Of course, more conventional ones like Crest are the center for research in energy systems. So let me just give you a sense of what we think the, the, uh, the vision is. And uh, I, you know, the general vision is we want to challenge our students to think about so-called social scale problems. And you know, it's, it's a different era from a time when we used to think about uh, basic research and applied research, and you know, we technologists were always thought of as the people that came a little bit down the waterfall. You know, there's a waterfall model, there's somebody doing exalted science, and then the engineers do uh, technology to transfer that into technology and then into instruments of commerce. So now I think that the model really is to think about societal scale systems and think a little bit about what the use-inspired technologies are. Some exemplars, of course, are energy and the environment. I'll say something about it. Another one, which is also the theme of this conference, is about intelligent infrastructures. You know, how do you harvest the Internet of Things into creating a better infrastructure for ourselves? And certainly nowadays, we're also thinking about cost-effective ways of the delivery of healthcare. Uh, and, and our model has been at Berkeley that we also cannot separate uh, technology from innovation, from entrepreneurship. And so what we've done is to actually create another one of these centers called the Fung Institute for Engineering Leadership, which 
both teaches undergraduates as well as graduates some things about entrepreneurship. There's a uh, so-called Berkeley method of entrepreneurship in terms of what it takes to create startups, what it takes to be able to talk about raising funds for them, and so on and so forth. And you know, this is all being baked into the curriculum really from a pretty early time, starting with the undergraduates. So uh, diving into the meat of the talk, let me just give you three examples of what this might mean. About 10 years ago, uh, starting with a set of uh, things called smart dust, or wireless sensor networks, there was a big push into the creation of these wireless sensor networks. And it's not a, an exaggeration to say that it has resulted in a way of ubiquitously really instrumenting the world. And here are some examples. Uh, you know, Great Duck Island is an island off the coast of Maine where we've used uh, wireless sensor networks to study the uh, nesting habits of birds. Redwood trees for understanding the ecology of uh, water absorption by the redwood trees. You know, there's no rain around these parts, so you've got to absorb the water from fog. Uh, wind response on bridges like the Golden Gate Bridge in terms of understanding what the sway of these bridges is. Uh, vineyards, you, you know, people are now doing specialty farming where uh, in Spain, for instance, you know, they have designer tomatoes where they monitor uh, what nutrients are needed to be able to grow better tomatoes. And the question is how you instrument this in vineyards, you know, wireless sensor networks for uh, determining the amount of nutrients that you put into the soil. And soil liquefaction was the other example. So moving along, though, I think these sensor webs are everywhere. You know, we certainly have heard about drones interfering with forest fires. But you know, they are being used more constructively. This is the Chicago Fire Department with breadcrumbs for being able to find their way out of fire. Uh, elder care, that's what the healthcare application is. And even you know, in uh, some fabs in Intel, they bake in wireless sensors into the wafer to make a determination of how the individual wafers are being processed. So that's moved on, but going forward, I think that we are now beginning to close the loop around these sensor networks and being able to actually take decisions based on them. And these new sets of applications is, uh, which involve things like robotics, traffic control, a new new smart grid, and so on and so forth. You know, uh, in the country of Germany, they've taken to calling this uh, industry 4.0. Uh, mercifully, we have uh, no such specific uh, nomenclature for these. It's really sort of what you do with data analytics around uh, data coming from these sensor networks. It's, uh, you know, it's different from just data analytics in that there's uh, time criticality of decision making that needs to be brought into bear. And this is really where things are at in terms of going into much more complicated applications. And that, you know, I think when we when we really say Internet of Things, I think what one really means are these wireless sensor networks embedded into the infrastructure, uh, other names, industrial internet, cyber physical systems, all of these really refer to the idea that you're making decisions based on analysis coming from this multiplicity of sensors. A specific, and, and you know, that in turn translates into a vision where you have uh, really a interface between a world of multiple wireless devices and sensors and a cloud on the inside and intermediated by our mobile devices or mobile computing platforms. And that sort of vision about swarms of sensors has been put together in what we, we call a vision that a colleague of mine, uh, Jan Rabai, has coined as the notion of trying to think about what you do in a world where there are a thousand radios per person. You know, we're already pretty close to the hundreds in terms of if you just sort of count the radios in your person today, you'll certainly have 20 or 30 radios on you. And you know, if you have a few RFIDs and so on and so forth, it really adds up to this. The question is what you do with the spectrum, with the smart homes, with these intelligent cars. And there are multiple important questions, the issues of what do you do with this data, the privacy of the data, what do you, e even with things like smart meters and homes, you know, there's a lot that you can tell from disaggregation, the questions about how, is information a service? And the question is how do you sort of, how do you build in mechanisms 
which uh, enable you to monetize this information. These are all big ticket items that we are beginning to address here. And of course, going beyond this, now both driven by the success of wearables, you know, we are beginning to think about what we are calling cyber biophysical systems. You know, you can have EEGs that fit into ear hearing aids. You can have devices that will do single neuron recordings. And the question is about how you use this information to be able to really do pretty fine, pretty fine grain uh, monitoring of uh, human health are really quite interesting. Intelligent skin is another intelligent surfaces. And so I feel that there's a lot of life left here in thinks, thinking about this true immersion uh, in this uh, devices, these devices. And we call these societal scale uh, cyber physical systems. And they're called societal scale because they need to be ubiquitous, they need to be pervasive, they need to disappear, you know, the way water and other water, energy, all of these other utilities have. And they need to be reliable, connectable, adaptive, and scalable. So, you know, having put up these illities, so to speak, it hasn't been always easy to deliver to them. And finally, the questions of the economics of how you monetize these service models is really quite important and has been an important part of what's been driving this ahead. And that's part of what we need to teach our students. Thinking a little further about another set of problems, I promise to give you three, and I'm also cognizant of leaving enough time to engage in a dialogue with you. You know, certainly the Pope and many other people have weighed in on what we should do about uh, carbon and global greenhouse gases. But, you know, if we sit back and think about some specifics, you know, perhaps we can think of something like the Silicon Roadmap, uh, a carbon roadmap. A carbon roadmap is a roadmap which has on its axis how many uh, tons of greenhouse gas emissions, primarily carbon dioxide, there are other gases as well, that you might need to go. In, in California, we have some statutes on the, on the books. There's something called AB 2020. There's another one called AB 1483 and so on, which ask for some mandatory reductions by 2020 and even more stringent ones by 2050. And, uh, and Governor Brown actually sort of plugged this in uh, at the Vatican uh, a few days ago. So the question is, how do you achieve these goals? These are goals that have been set by policymakers. They've been set by IPCCs and other international bodies. IPCC, of course, will make a new set of guidelines in 2015, this October in Paris. And, but to get to this is not always easy or trivial. And the question is, are there lessons learned from the Silicon Roadmap that could be used to be able to guide both the technologies that are needed, development that is needed, as well as the investment profile that is needed to be able to achieve these. And certainly, you know, carbon is only one axis for the roadmap. There's questions of air quality, capital outlays, job growth and creation, which is important to many other parts of the world other than the United States, also in the United States, and the diversity of energy sources. So you may recall that in Copenhagen, uh, you know, our fellow Allied, MI, uh, IIT alum, uh, Jairam Ramesh, uh, actually was pretty instrumental in these Copenhagen talks about making the case that it was important to not just talk about uh, carbon emissions, but to also talk about capital outlays, job growth, and creation. And I, I think that's a pretty valid point, and I think we need to address this as well in the, in the roadmap. And so the way we've uh, tried to engage with this is, you know, here's an example of where technology, policy, investment, both at the micro level as well as the macro level, go hand in hand. And just as in the case of the silicon roadmap, a carbon roadmap needs to be a living object rather than something that gathers dust on somebody's shelves. It's done once and then gathers uh, dust on somebody's shelf. So we need to have a process, and part of what we've been trying to do is to be a convener the way the SIA was of a silicon roadmap to be able to put together all of these questions about what technologies are needed, what the gaps are, 
you know, to have these color-coded charts about red, green, and yellow in terms of where we are in the technology development, as well as who will make the investments to get to this. So uh, and here's an example of how this would look. You know, uh, these, these things are called, uh, these are diagrams of supply and demand. The United Nations maintains one of these for every country. They're called sort of Tokyo subway diagrams. You know, they have all the supplies on the left and all the demand areas on the right. The demand for all countries, this is the US numbers, are pretty much broken up into three areas, buildings, transportation, and industry. It's roughly 35%, 30%, 25%. Those are the numbers in the US, a little more. In, in other countries, more or less. But those are sort of the big areas. And the question is, how do you systematically reduce uh, the consumption in each one of those, the, uh, the carbon production in each one of those? And for buildings, you know, in turn, it translates into IT, green electronics, the cooperative grid, energy storage. So each one of these gets parsed down the way a, a silicon roadmap did into trying to do this. And here's an example. My colleague, and actually also a fellow IIT alum, Arun Majumdar, came up when he was at the uh, Department of Energy about this notion that buildings probably need to have an operating system as well. The details are perhaps less important, but maybe you, know, you can, as part of a roadmap, think about having building operating systems which monitor all of this. And, I, and you know, so this in turn, uh, you know, when we drive cars, the sort of Prius effect, you know, when people are shown consumption, they tend to do better. And perhaps this should be true for buildings as well. Owners and, uh, you know, people, occupants, need to have a stake in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in doing better. And so, you know, we, we are trying to do this. Uh, a university campus is actually a good surrogate for an industrial atmosphere, you know, a uh, computer science department is like a data center, uh, a chemistry department is like, uh, like a biotech company, and so on and so forth. And you know, they're good surrogates for trying out uh, both an incentive structure for incentivizing people to reduce the, their carbon footprints, but also try to do this large reductions. You know, 50% reductions can be really substantial to get to the goals. One other area which I think is pretty critical is this area of synthetic biology. So synthetic biology is really uh, sort of recombinant DNA on, you know, really amped up quite a bit. It's the notion that you can actually uh, synthesize devices uh, in a systematic way, engineer devices and biological systems. And this has certainly its uh, use in biofuels has been touted, but beyond that, its applications in areas such as specialty chemicals, uh, agriculture, ag bio, all of these are pretty big ticket items. And here, too, really, you know, there are, when you start talking about this immediately, you have all kinds of uh, red lights go out and you go off in your head in terms of what are the legal consequences, what are the ethical consequences. When all is said and done, you are synthesizing, you may be synthesizing new organisms as you go forward. So there is really an ethical dimension as well as a dimension in terms of thinking about engineering biology, which I think is a, has been a key feature. And, and so I gave you these, and you know, just again, the way you had uh, fabs and so on and so forth. One can conceptualize biofabs for being able to put together a, device, a, you know, a way to, character, to both manufacture as well as design uh, biological parts and devices. Uh, so, you know, I've given you three examples of uh, the kinds of areas, you know, broad areas, where there are just incredible opportunities. You know, they all span some fusion of the best new information technologies, biotechnologies and uh, nanotechnologies. I want to spend a few minutes now telling you about a pet passion of mine, which uh, Arun Sareen asked me to be sure to cover here. So we have established, just in the, in the idea of thinking about global problems, a way of thinking about poverty alleviation. And we call that development engineering. And it is the kind of area where you say it's really the engineering of development, as in poverty alleviation. And I'm sure some of you can relate to this. When we were all growing up, we were told you know, alternate technologies, appropriate technologies. And these really had the smell 
of being old-fashioned hand-me-down technologies. So I'm here to tell you that working with USAID, we have seen that really the challenges of providing technologies for helping people lift themselves out of poverty, at heart, you know, it's really about empowerment. You know, this really technology can help, and that there's a procedure for doing this, which is very, very exciting. And we found common cause with the USAID administrator who just stepped down called Rajiv Shah, who helped sort of sponsor a big activity. You know, we called it uh, DIL, you know, it's Development Innovation Lab is what we named it, but it was really, you know, based on the Hindi word here, to put together what an agenda of this might look like. So let me just lead you through a few of these things. This is perhaps a little too much detail. So what lies behind it is really a sense that, uh, you know, the way uh, poverty alleviation works is somebody comes up with some set of methods for cleaner water or some such of better stoves, and then, you know, the academics publish a paper about a pilot and everybody declares victory and goes home. And the joke is that people call this, there's lots of pilots and no planes. You know, because these methods don't scale. And the question is, can you, how does one assess pilots during their operation to determine what's wrong. Almost always there are impediments to their scaling. So working with Google, uh, they've developed a thing called the Open Data Toolkit, and actually they now say, uh, have an open source version of this called Missouri, which is a way of recording sensors, sensor data from a lot of these kinds of applications, be they the use of water pumps, which is on the left, or energy usage in smart grids in Rajasthan, and, and really sort of assess the efficacy of interventions as you go. And so this real-time sensing is really changing developmental economics. You know, fundamentally, this is something that people used to do. And I want to give you a few examples of this. Uh, this is an example in, uh, in Indonesia. Actually, it's in Borneo. The, it really, there are lots of places that the cell phone network doesn't reach. The question is, can you build a network in a box with even intermittent connectivity to the rest of the world so as to enable you to provide baseline services to a village. And, we, and this is the numbers are about a billion people don't have access to this, even in the United States, you know, several remote parts of the U.S., but simply not, uh, it's not in the economic interests of the major providers to provide service. And the question is, how can you develop these community cell phone towers, and what is the economic case for doing it? And here's an example of the kinds of startups there's this particular one is a Berkeley startup called Indaga, and it has a method. It divide, it's really an antenna plus a box, a low power box, because you know, even electricity is intermittent to these places, to be able to irradiate an area and to have the customers pay as they go, you know, pay as they go model rather than paying for fixed infrastructure to be able to provide baseline services. And the service, the connections don't have to be synchronous in the sense that they can be used for text messaging rather than for voice communication. So they're connected on to the rest of the network when, they, uh, you know, when the connectivity is available or when the dish is available. Uh, and, and this raises a lot of questions. It uses uh, unused parts of the GSM spectrum after making sure that you're not impinging on somebody else's use, but these are all issues where the FCC needs to step in and make rulings. Even in Indonesia, we had to have the Ministry of Telecommunications uh, step in and allow for the use of these so-called white spaces. But this model finally was put to, you know, when we, we assessed this, you know, the school actually, not only a school district adopted this, and not only were they able to provide the service, but they made $1,000 a month, and so it basically subsidized the school operations. So this is now being scaled up, used in the Philippines, several other places, and that's... Another example is a thing called a cell scope. A cell scope is really a microscope attached to a cell phone. Uh, you know, in itself, it's not uh, such a profound invention, but the consequences of cell scopes, a cell scope is also a startup that comes out of Berkeley, it is sort of smartphone-based diagnostics for uh, samples, be they sputum samples or blood samples that are taken remotely, and the diagnosis can be done either on the phone or else you can beam the images onto a tertiary site which can do the analytics for you. So this has now gone through several phases. It began with tuberculosis, and then the Gates Foundation sort of picked up on this, and they use it for treating something called loa loa, which is a cousin of uh, 
uh, you know, it's not unrelated to the outbreak in West Africa recently, uh, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and this has actually been tried out for doing the diagnostics of Loa Loa. And then more recently in Thailand and now in uh, northern India, it's being used to do remote ophthalmology. Uh, you know, so as to be able to detect retinal uh, detachment and so on and so forth. Lots of places where people can't afford walking in. So this, and, you know, it's, uh, these are all companies which have their own startups, their for-profits, but, you know, there's also pretty hard technology that goes into them. Another one is called We Care Solar. So Laura Stachel, really, she's a uh, pediatric surgeon, so she felt that whenever she operated in the developing world, she, she didn't have light. You know, and so she built a low-cost solar suitcase with these, uh, you know, with the lights that are needed, you know, high-intensity lights for doing surgery, and this has now been prototyped and being sold by Flextronics at really quite inexpensive prices to enable us to do uh, interventions at remote sites. Another example, and this is, you know, and I also wanted to highlight this, you know, uh, we, we've actually found common cause with a lot of the IITs on this. Uh, uh, you know, with the uh, with the the village base station and so on and so forth. It's IIT Delhi, and then the, this particular one, it's IIT Bombay and IIT Kharagpur and Jadavpur University. And you know, these are all places where there's a huge amount of student interest because you know, for electrochemical arsenic removal, this is certainly true in Bangladesh, but also in West Bengal. And the question of how do you get arsenic out to levels which are satisfactory and inexpensive enough really is it uses really the best of new nanotechnologies and new materials the amount of energy if you were going to use uh, catalysis uh, you're going to use uh, uh, electrical methods to separate out the arsenic have it bond to iron or something like that is really quite substantive and so you know devising these solutions and actually when this particular thing was presented to the parliament uh, the Indian Parliament actually was amazed that they could deliver this at three paisa per liter. And you know, these, these numbers are important because a lot of people feel that water is free and sort of pay for uh, removal even, you know, these are really pretty much small numbers. And there are many other such examples. Now, I, I think that uh, I want to conclude a little bit by saying what implications all of this has for education. You know, the millennial generation has been much maligned for having a short attention span. But in my, in my impression, this is one of the most idealistic generations that has been in a college campus in 30 years. Not since the 70s do we have such an idealistic group. They are not content with taking 3D prerequisite classes. They want to dream big, and they want to make a difference in the world. It's important for us to be able to give them the kinds of venues when they can actually do this. So we expressly had this project called Big Ideas, where we encourage undergraduates to think about big ideas which they think will change the world, and we give them price money. You know, for an undergraduate to receive $5,000 or $10,000 to work on a project is a huge vote of confidence. And to institutionalize it, and then provide them the mentorship to guide their way through what they do is re really very, very rewarding. And in fact, you know, criti critics of this uh, uh, way of education, you know, people say learning by doing really doesn't teach you fundamentals. And certainly in our own education, certainly in my own education, you know, we were given sort of a three-year grounding of fundamentals before we were allowed to touch anything. So, you know, I think on the other hand, letting people do always gives them a greater taste for thinking about the fundamentals. So, yeah, I think I'm being told, I mean, given the hook, so I think I'm uh, ready to stop. So, Sorry to interrupt, take any questions. Dean Shankar. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of questions that came up, so we thought we'd spend at least a few minutes, if you don't mind. Uh, you're a role model for a lot of people in this audience. And uh, so one of the key questions coming up is, how do you cultivate an academic career, and particularly if you could illustrate some of the inflection points in your journey from IIT to Dean of Engineering at Cal? You know, I have to say, uh, you know, an, an IIT education is a very rich experience. And I think about the fact that 
because we were a residential uh, campus, there was a lot that happened outside the classroom. And there was a lot that happened in terms of thinking about the social context. And you know, I think uh, we all sort of think about beating up on each other and, and all, also the card games. But there was a lot of very, very wonderful debate about whether what we were doing was relevant certainly for India, and whether it was relevant for changing the world. So in a lot of ways, you know, those really stuck with me. And I had not felt that in high school growing up in Pune. Hmm. But I think at the IIT, this was very much in the air. You know, sometimes it was with more radical philosophies, and sometimes it was with the technology bent. And so I, I felt I got, I felt a lot of that really in an IIT. And it really has sort of steered me through all these uh, twists and turns. Okay. Uh, one more question, since we're running out of time. And that was, uh, and, and I know you touched on this uh, during your presentation, but people are still curious. What are the frontiers of research that you're excited about at Berkeley? And how do you encourage entrepreneurial activities uh, on campus? OK, so I, I really think that this, uh, what do you do with uh, data coming from these networks of sensors, the Internet of Things, and then to do analytics, to do this uh, machine learning data analytics, and then to do decision making, it's really going to change a lot of things. It's certainly going to change uh, industry. It's going to change how we operate a lot of uh, older sectors. But also, I think as we do go forward, the future of intelligence, you know, what we, machine intelligence, human intelligence, uh, you know, the debate that's raging, uh, even personified by this film Ex Machina, about sort of where we are going, about are machines really going to be smarter than us? Are they going to reason like that? Are they going to have common sense? This, I think, is, uh, you know, it also calls into effect what we think about. Uh, epistemology, you know, the, what, what, what the science of learning, the science of knowledge. So that, I think, these are pretty big ticket items. They span neurophysics on the one hand, machine learning on the other hand, uh, maybe these devices that are coming in. And so, you know, I think that's pretty good. Now, in terms of your second question, I'll keep it short because I know that the next speaker is getting queued up. I, I think that, again, a traditional university has stayed out of entrepreneurship. And that, I think, has been a mistake. The question of how far you should go in supporting uh, incubation, in terms of supporting uh, acceleration, all of that, is, an, is a good one to ask. I think if you reach too far into the, into the commercial world, I think you're interfering with yeah. the, you know, the, the rigors of competition in the real world. But I think a lot of us are struggling with how much we should build into our educational mission. And I think we should. Okay. Thank you, Dean Shastri. Thank you. Let's give him a big hand. And as a Cal parent, go Bears. <laughs> go Bears.